Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and today we're going to talk about basic methods in genetic testing. The first method I want to talk about is the pedigree charts. And because it's such a big topic, I already made a own video about it. It's a method which is used to determine the probability of one of the offsprings to be affected by a specific disease. And if you want to know more about it, just click on the banner above and watch the entire video. The next method is cytogenetics. And one of the most frequently used techniques in cytogenetic testing is the G-banding technique. Here, metaphase chromosomes are treated with trypsin to partially digest them, and then the chromosomes are stained with a GIMSA stain. After that GIMSA staining, adenine and tumine-rich areas are considered as gene-poor heterochromatic areas, which will be colored more darkly under a microscope. Less densely packed genetic material, rich in guanine and cytosine, will appear lighter. That leads to the appearance of differently colored bands, which leads to a unique pattern for each chromosome number. So by the help of a numbering system of these bands, the different chromosomes can be identified clearly. Other banding techniques besides the G-banding technique are C-banding, which stands for constitutive heterochromatin. So here another part of the chromosome is colored. Then the Q-banding technique or quinacrine banding technique. Quinacrine is a medication and also this is used to color different parts of the chromosome. Then air banding, which is called reverse gimsa staining. So as you can imagine, it's just basically that those areas that stain lighter in gimsa stain will stain darker in reverse gimsa stain and vice versa. And then the T-banding technique where T stands for telomeric and a telomere is the end cap of the chromosome which will be colored because in some, for example, neoplastic diseases, those telomeres will be much longer and this can be identified under a microscope. This technique is used when within a family there are multiple congenital anomalies, when there's a intellectual disability with or without dysmorphic features in a baby, or when a baby is born with ambiguous genitalia, so when a doctor can't tell from the external genitalia whether it's a boy or a girl, when there's a impaired growth and puberty, or when a couple experiences infertility and recurrent miscarriages or unexplained stillbirths. Also, those tests are used when a family member is at risk for structural chromosomal aberrations or if a patient has some onchohematologic disease or other syndromes with rare fragile sites in the chromosome. There are different advantages and limitations to this cytogenic testing. First of all, a positive is that this testing method provides information about all 23 pairs of chromosomes in a single assay and it's used in the diagnosis of balances of chromosomal rearrangements, so when a part of a chromosome is missing or copied. But a problem is that it requires 10 to 14 days until first results can be observed, so it needs quite long and also it cannot detect submicroscopic rearrangement such as micro deletions, micro duplications, all kind of that. I made a video on mutations also, so you can see that also if you want. And also this kind of testing is not possible to be used in single gene disorders. Now I want to talk about another kind of testing that is possible to make. It's called FISH and this is a abbreviation for fluorescent in situ hybridization. This at first sounds quite difficult but fluorescent just means basically that there is a light created which can be observed under a fluorescent microscope. In situ just means that the chromosome stays where it is. So within the cell we don't have to extract it. It's possible to still color just in a blood culture or under some histological slide and hybridization means that there's some kind of mix created of the original DNA and a new DNA because in this technique there's a sequence of single-stranded DNA created which is complementary to the tested individual's DNA and this is called the probe and this probe is labeled with a fluorescent dye so when then this single-stranded DNA will bind to its target 
single-stranded DNA within the genome of the to-be-tested individual, then they create a, a double strand. And this can be seen under a fluorescent microscope once the slide is being scanned. And then depending on the number of the signals, which can be detected during the scanning, evaluations can be made whether or not the testing was successful. And there are different types how this can be used. There's for example the locus specific where only one where only one sequence is created and this only binds to one specific region within a chromosome. So this is a test if a researcher wants to test if there's a specific gene missing. This can be an indicator for a specific disease. Then another type is the alphoid or centromeric test and this is used to find the correct chromosome number. So the different sequences will have different colors and once they bind to their, spe uh, to their specific chromosome it will create a colorful karyotype. So usually the karyotypes that are most often observed in biology classes or other kind of settings are those GIMSA G-banding technique karyotypes where the chromosomes are in gray or a blackish color and are arranged according to their number. But there's also the possibility to make a colorful karyotype. And there are specific sequences which are unique for this specific chromosome number are created and will bind to this chromosome so that a researcher can identify which chromosome number this has to be. Another type which can be tested is the whole chromosome probe. And there are many small probes are synthesized and those will attach to different parts on the same chromosome. This is important. So as you know, a chromosome has two sister chromatids and a centromere and so respectively four different arms. Usually depending on where the centromere is located, it can be two short arms and two long arms or four equally long arms, but there will be always except for in a telomeric or acromeric chromosome, four arms. And these kind of sequences will bind to different points on these arms and the centromere to identify, to identify that the chromosome is complete. So if some of those fluorescent sequences will not be able to bind, then the researcher will be able to see that a part of the chromosome must be missing. And that's why the colorful or the fluorescent sequence was not able to bind to this kind of single-stranded DNA. This is used whenever there's an abnormality in the chromosome structure or number so that this can be identified with either of the different methods or also in the detection of a marker chromosome. This technique can, in opposition to the other technique, be used for micro deletions and also micro duplications, as then more of these fluorescent sequences will bind to the chromosome and more signals will be generated. Also, the detection of mosaicism is possible and also different genetic abnormalities associated with cancer, like for example, multiple myeloma or chronic lymphocytic leukemia can be possibly detected with this FISH method. I hope that everything was clear. If you have any questions, you can post it in the comments. I will try to answer as soon as possible. And I want to thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, I would be very happy if you could subscribe. That's it for now. And I hope to see you in the next video again.